true murder. It's a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer. I would also play with you. Thank you to play with Sam. The Night Stalker, BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. On February 13, 2017, two Indiana teenagers, Abigail Williams, 13, and Liberty German, 14, went for a walk in the woods near the abandoned Monin High Bridge. They never returned home. Their bodies were discovered on Valentine's Day morning, sparking a torrent of news coverage and social media speculation that engrossed the attention of people around the world. A grainy photo of the suspected killer walking across the bridge and a chilling cell phone recording of his voice saying down the hill captured the public's attention. Numerous possible suspects were brought to the attention of the authorities, but dismissed leaving everyone wondering who could have committed such a heinous crime. Author Nick Edwards, host of the wildly popular True Crime Garage podcast, was fascinated by the case and for years conducted his own extensive research and commentary. As such, he was able to dissect the investigation that included an extensive list of possible suspects, such as a hatchet-wielding lunatic, a kidnapper with unusual tattoos, a murderous pastor, a rapist, and a father and son catfishing team. Then, in late October 2022, local pharmacy technician Richard Allen was charged with the murders. His arrest raised multiple questions about how he was able to evade law enforcement for so long and what motivated him to commit such a horrific crime. In the Delphi murders, the quest to find the man on the bridge Edwards and his best-selling co-author Brian Whitney, you have a very soft voice, Susan, provide a detailed account of the investigation from the day the girls' bodies were found to the events leading up to Alan's arrest and a unique insight into the minds of the killer and those who worked tirelessly to bring him to justice. The book that we're featuring this evening is The Delphi Murders, The Quest to Find the Man on the Bridge. With my special guest, journalist and author and host of True Crime Garage, Nick Edwards. Welcome to the program, and thank you so much for this interview, Nick Edwards. Thank you so much for having me on True Murder, Dan. It's always been a goal of mine as a podcaster to be on your show and a life goal of mine to write a true crime book. And so today I'm able to check a couple of boxes off here. Thank you so much, and it's a thrill to have you on, finally, on True Murder. And congratulations on this incredible book, The Delphi Murders. Thank you. Let's start off, just as you do in the introduction, sort of an introduction to where you have lived and how you came to understand and learn about this case involving this bridge guy. And this is in Carroll County Comet. You were talking about the Carroll County Comet newspaper. And every day when you resided in central Ohio, as you still do, you would go to the mailbox and get your Carroll County Comet newspaper. Why was that? And tell us about everything you learned at that time about the bridge guy. Well, I became a subscriber. It's a weekly small paper that comes out of Carroll County, Indiana, and it's seven, eight pages, roughly. Very small community, very small newspaper. And a lot of it's just things going on in that community. Well, I became a subscriber to that newspaper years ago because I was so crazy involved as a armchair detective web sleuth person from afar, mainly as my daytime job as a true crime podcaster, became very wrapped up in this murder investigation. And so I thought, you know what, I'll subscribe to their local newspaper and it shows up in my mailbox about once a week, usually on a Wednesday or a Thursday. And I go and I pull it out of the mailbox. And and for years, you know, we knew what the suspect looked like, or at least we thought we did, because the girls in this horrific situation 
were brave enough to capture his image via cell phone. And America, this case very quickly became a nationwide case, hit the spotlight quickly, and it very quickly spread to other states. And many people online were looking for the suspect, the suspect that we were calling Bridge Guy or BG. He ended up getting all kinds of different monikers over over the years. And so I, like many other people, thought that if if I spent enough time on this or if I just kept looking, that was the only way to satiate my fascination with this case and with the investigation itself was to troll around and look for Bridge Guy. I didn't think that I actually would, but given I believe that the suspect was local and that's what law enforcement was telling us. They believed that he was local or had ties to the Delphi area. And so I thought, you know what, I'll subscribe to this newspaper. And every week I, I trekked out to the, the mailbox, would retrieve it. And then I would thumb through the pages looking at all the pictures. And again, like I said, we all thought we knew what bridge guy looked like. As much as it helped the investigation, having a, a photograph of the man on the bridge in other ways, it also hindered the investigation. Now, you take us in this book back to Delphi, Indiana, and take us back to shortly before this and the things that happened in the area that you lived in and the crimes that affected you earlier on before you were the co-host of True Crime Garage. Well, doing different interviews throughout the years in regard to my work with True Crime Garage, almost always some of the first questions that I get, what got you into true crime? What got you into podcasting? You know, what inspired you to start a true crime podcast? And so I thought, you know what, maybe let's go ahead and answer some of those questions in the book as well, because the book is very much about the the case, the Delphi double murders case. It's also very much about the investigation, because in that investigation, they were not telling they being law enforcement, were not telling the public a lot of information about the case. And they were the public was very starved for information about the case, mainly because law enforcement kept coming to us and asking us for our help. Have you seen this man? Do you know who this man is? Here's some behaviors, some post-defense behaviors that we think that he may be experiencing or exhibiting for all to see. And maybe you, the public, could tell us who Bridge Guy is or identify him for us. So, it was this weird back and forth, right, where you have law enforcement asking the public for help, but in turn, not giving the public very much information about what it is that they knew or what possible evidence they had in the case. In fact, we knew we didn't even know how the girls were killed. And so it was this very interesting situation. And it was a case that I got very much wrapped up in. I chose to tell the story in this manner because it did involve some of me in the story, right? The book is very much about the case, the investigation, and mainly my observations and my observations that, about the investigation, but also my observations about what I was hearing other people question about the investigation itself. And in, in the foreword, I think that I laid it out perfectly or as best I could for the reader going forward as they march into this book that says, you know, portions of this book were written in real time before an arrest was made. This murder investigation was nearly six years active before charges were filed. Here in these pages, you will find the timeline, the facts, and one man's thoughts, observations, and obsessions with an American murder investigation. This tragedy was never far from my heart. And it is, it's a horrible, heartbreaking story of, of two girls that were out in a public setting in the middle of the week, and they were abducted in broad daylight. And an incredibly heartbreaking story and an incredibly heartbreaking case, but also a very fascinating murder investigation. Parts of it played out in front of our, our eyes as we watched over the course of five and a half years. Tell us about, as you write, February 13, 2017, Abby Williams, 13-year-old, and her friend Liberty, Libby German, 14-year-old, were dropped off by Libby's older sister, Kelsey. Now tell us a little bit about this scenic Monin High Bridge, this abandoned railroad bridge that goes over the Deer Creek in Carroll County, Indiana. And tell us about the previous evening over at Libby's house. So Delphi, Indiana, this is very much a tight-knit community, great people, hardworking people, God-fearing people, salt of the earth. And 
on that day, Kelsey, Libby's older sister, drops the two of them off to they're going to enjoy a day outdoors. It was unseasonably warm for that day. They were going to go out and hike the trails. There's a beautiful trail system that leads up to this Monin High Bridge, and it's an abandoned train bridge, rail railroad bridge from years ago that it's not part of the trail system. You're not really supposed to be out there walking on it, but many people do, teenagers, adults, kids. And from my understanding, I didn't grow up in this area. I grew up in Ohio. But from my understanding, for the younger folks, this is kind of a, a rite of passage, right? At some point that a friend or a loved one or a cousin you go out there on the trails, and at some point, we all either cross the bridge or we don't cross the bridge. Chicken out and don't go across it. And on this day, Libby, who had crossed the bridge on several occasions before, you know, she has an older sister. Maybe she went there at one point with her older sister and crossed the Monin High Bridge. But on this day, Abby, her best friend, these two were the tightest of friends, the kind of friends that were so close in relationship and had been such longtime friends that often they're the kind that you would see Abby and not Libby. Your first question is going to be, well, where's Libby? Right. And of course, the opposite, when you see Libby without Abby, you were used to seeing the two of them together, super tight friends, the best of friends. And on that day, Libby was going to take her friend and the two of them were going to cross the Monin High Bridge together. Now, you talk about their that someone was supposed to pick them up, and that being the father, Derek. Correct. And it's a complicated family situation. She lived with her grandparents, actually. But tell us about what happens and what's the last correspondence that family members have with Libby. The last real correspondence would be when Libby and Abby were dropped off that day by Libby's sister. And when Derek arrives at the trails, we're Dan, we're only talking about a very small window of time that has passed here, roughly let's say two hours to make it nice and neat. Mm -hmm. But Derek shows up to retrieve the girls and Libby's grandmother, Becky Patty, is kind of the boss of, of the family. And as you said, Libby's being raised by Becky and her husband, Mike Patty, and they're the nicest, best people. And grandma basically says to Libby, sure, you know, if you can get a ride there, uh, and if you can get a ride back, because Becky's out working that day, if you can secure a ride there and back, sure, the two of you can go out to the trail system and you can, you can only be out there a brief period of time. Whatever time you can get dropped off and whatever time you get picked up, that's that's the parameters. And so Derek arrives and he's calling Libby's cell phone. Libby got a cell phone for Christmas just a couple months earlier. And so he's not getting in touch with Libby. And so he phones Becky and says, you know, I'm at the location. I don't understand. I can't get a hold of her. And now we have grandma who's going to join in the efforts of trying to contact Libby. And before we know it, we have a lot of the of Libby's family out there searching for both of the girls that evening. Now, both of these were good kids, but, you know, they were also of the teenage years. And we all know that it's not terribly uncommon for teenage kids to not be where they say they are going to be. So I don't think that anybody was overly panicked that evening, but there was enough of a concern that law enforcement was called and a more formal search was put together looking for the two girls. It got dark. It was unseasonably warm that day, but it got cold that evening. It's Indiana. It's February. Right. And at some point, the sheriff, Tobe Lesenby, and the Carroll County Sheriff's Department, along with the firefighters and all the other persons that were there searching for the girls, they had to decide to call off the search. This is rough terrain. It can be dangerous. The Monin High Bridge itself, I think I would, as somebody who does not enjoy heights that much, I would consider it to be dangerous any time of day, let alone in the dark. But it's because it's a nature area trail system. It's not well lit. They call off the search. And so Mike Patty goes on the, the late night news, just informing everybody, hey, my granddaughter's missing me and a bunch of other people in the sheriff's department have been out here looking for her. We also have some of Abby's family that were on the news that night. And you can view those news segments on YouTube still to this day. 
and you see the parents or the acting parents who you can see the look of concern on their face. But again, nobody's overly panicked at this point. Right. And the search for the girls would resume very early the next morning. Now, where I sit in Ohio, this was not even news for us. I'm, I'm over mm. 200 miles away. Right. And it wasn't news to us. And I was already doing our True Crime Garage podcast at that point, still working a day job. I've been very lucky to have a wonderful audience that we've grown throughout the years, a loyal audience. And now I'm able to make True Crime Garage my day job. But back then I was the leader of a team involved, heavily involved in my demanding job at the time. And it wasn't till the day after the girls were found that the story found me via the internet. And when I read the, the short little news snippet of two girls are missing in a public area, in a park, basically, let's call it a park for lack of a better term. And then they're found nearby and they foul play suspected two homicides. When, when I read that snippet, I, I knew right away a couple of things. The first thing I thought for, I'm trying to envision how this could have went down. So I'm thinking a lot of things had to take place. But also, I was thinking, well, this, this will probably be solved relatively quickly. Typically, the way that a homicide works, and Dan, you're, you know this better than anybody because right. you, you've been doing this for so long. But typically, it's, it's a pretty basic scenario. Person A is angry at person B, and something happens, and, and person B is killed by person A. That's typically how these things work. Well, in this situation, we're talking about younger folks. Our two victims were younger, and often police and detectives are going to investigate our social circles, our families, our colleagues. But when we talk about younger people, typically they have a smaller social circle than us adults do. Sure. And so I thought very likely this would be solved. They would have a suspect in custody within 24, 48, 72 hours, traditional police work was going to work real well here. And then, no, we find out three days later that, no, that's not going to be the case. And, oh, by the way, there's some interesting evidence that they have in this case that we typically don't have in a lot of other cases, especially ones that drag on. You talk about that evidence that is released. It's very, very interesting. But there, so tell us about the evidence that they did have and did release and immediately but also the things that weren't answered for you at all that you had to just speculate about. One thing that was very strange about the case was we get a picture of somebody that they were not calling a suspect. They were saying, this is somebody that we would like to talk to. This person was in the area on the day that the girls went missing. So we know that they're dropped off in the afternoon. And then the following day, their bodies are found around noontime. And we're not told how they were killed or how they were found. We know they were found by one of the search teams, but the state of the crime scene of where they were found, we're not given information about that. We're not told. They've not narrowed down the time of death or as far as what they were telling the public. And then we get this picture of a guy that police say that they want to talk to, that they believe he could have some information. He He's probably a witness. And I've seen this and, you know, I've been doing True Crime Garage since 2015. We've reviewed hundreds of cases and I've been eyeballs deep in true crime books for, for years now, a couple decades, in fact. And I'd seen in other cases, especially when we have more sophisticated investigators, typically state police, larger agencies that have bigger better resources than some of the smaller agencies. And then you have the FBI as well. Right. But I've seen in many cases where they do, they say, hey, this is a person that we just want to talk to. And oftentimes I've never seen it pan out where that person is not the suspect that they're right. actually looking for. Yeah. And it's not it's not terribly common, but it doesn't it has happened on occasion where they say this is a person we would like to talk to or Here's a description of somebody that was seen in the area or a vehicle that was seen in the area. And the the person that actually committed the crime will try to get ahead of that by going to law enforcement and saying, oh, oh by the way, that blue car that you mentioned on the news the other night, I'm the owner of the blue car. I was in that area for right. this reason or that reason, um, not because I was you know, doing anything terrible. So in this case, immediately, Dan, I'm thinking this is our suspect. And I was wondering right. how long it was going to take. I was wondering, would this guy 
walk into the Carroll County Sheriff's Department and try to explain away why his image was captured there on the trail system? Or would it drag on where they were unable to locate this guy? And if it does drag on, how long until they change this narrative into this is our actual suspect? And what other information did they have about this guy who they just had his image at that time or had only released the image to the public? So it was it was a bizarre investigation to me and a very intriguing investigation because here we go. They're releasing what I call breadcrumbs to the public of this is what we have and we need your help, public. And here's some breadcrumbs to lead you part way down the trail. But at some point, we need somebody to to start giving us breadcrumbs in return to help us with our investigation. So I had a lot of questions about what was going on there in Carroll County. Now, let's talk about that image itself, the issues that you had and other people had with the image itself. And then what actually does the image show and portray? Well, the problem I've always had with the image, Dan, is that you review people's statements online, social networks and social media and whatnot, and even people on camera who have talked about this case, they often say, dissect the image and tell you what bridge guy or what the person who later we're told is the suspect. They tell us what he looks like. And I've always looked at this picture and gone, it's not that great of a picture. I don't think we know what bridge guy looks like. In fact, I think it's a little irresponsible to sit here and pretend to know what he looks like based off of this image. And that's why I say early in the book that all we really knew was that we were looking for a white male who was wearing a blue or dark colored jacket out on the trail system that was seen on the bridge that day. That's truly when you look at that, I think those are really the only very concrete things that we we can truly take away from this photo. You know, I've seen everything under the sun argued and debated about what people think that they see in this photo online over the years. Is he wearing a hat? No, he's not wearing a hat. His hood is up. Yes, he is wearing a hat. It's one of those flapjack hats. He's wearing boots. No, he's not wearing boots. He's wearing tennis shoes. He has something in his jacket. He has a fanny pack on. He's wearing something covering his mask. So covering his face. So there there were all these items that were truly just up for debate at the end of the day. While this picture is intended and hopefully will help us get an arrest and find the suspect, it was also causing a a stir amongst the, the, the general public because nobody could really agree on what it is that he looked like. Now, there were some witnesses discovered by police that it saw this bridge guy, apparently. Mm -hmm. So what was the sketch that was released? And what was the response to the sketch? Well, that was another troubling thing with this investigation. So we get a composite sketch of the suspect released to the public, and and people went wild with that sketch. And then later, uh, much later, in fact, we get a different composite sketch that I mean, some say is it's supposed to be a younger version of the of the previous sketch. So the first sketch was released in July of 2017. And in that sketch, interestingly enough, it shows a, a man and who is older in appearance than the follow up sketch that is released in April of 2019. And in the first sketch, we see an older man with a hoodie on and he's got some kind of possibly a goatee, definitely some kind of facial hair. And he is wearing a hat in the sketch. And then in the follow-up sketch in April of 2019, we see what I would describe as a much younger looking man, more clean cut with no facial hair, a more prominent chin, not wearing a hat. And there's no hood depicted around his neck like we have with the previous sketch. And so, and then we're told by law enforcement that this new sketch is taking priority. We, We want you to focus on this new sketch more than the previous sketch. And so this was very interesting and a a weird kind of strategy that I, look, I'm not going to lie. I've, I've seen three, maybe four other cases that I can think of where multiple composite sketches of, of suspects were released and they don't particularly look like one another. So that wasn't 
totally outside of of the box there, but most people weren't used to that kind of information coming from law enforcement. And I don't think a lot of people knew what to do with that information. In fact, what I had seen too, and what I was hearing, Dan, was that this new sketch was, it wasn't just news to the public. It was news to a lot of people in law enforcement. And it was news to the families of the two victims as well, that they had found out 15, 20, 30 minutes before the rest of us that, oh, by the way, today we are releasing a new and very different composite sketch of the suspect that we are looking for. One last thing, they did take some audio from Libby's phone and they mm-hmm. did release that to the public again, asking for the public's help. What was that audio clip? What did it contain? And what did you deduce from that clip itself? Well, there. so the, the two victims here, when they were approached, Libby takes out her cell phone. Maybe she already has it out because we know that she snapped a photo of Abby prior and it, that was released on Snapchat. And so something about this man on the bridge spooked her or nudged her enough. There was something about him. Maybe they had seen him before on one of the trails. Maybe they had passed him and he was creepy earlier, or maybe it's the way he's walking. You know, when, when, when that image later became a, a very short video clip of him taking a step and a half or two steps on the bridge, I always thought that it looked like he was moving at a rather uncomfortably fast pace on that bridge. We're talking about an abandoned railroad bridge that's very tall, very high. It goes over the creek. If you f- stumble and fall, you're going off the side of that bridge. It's not incredibly wide. There, it's old, it's run down. There's, there's probably ties that are missing. So he, our bridge guy, our suspect is lucky enough that when his image is captured, he's looking down. That's probably because he's keeping an eye on his footing as he's going across the bridge. I'd always wondered if he was moving at an uncomfortably fast pace and maybe that tipped the girls off that there's something up with this dude because he's going across this bridge fast. And we just came across it and look how careful we were as we were going across this bridge. So they capture an image of him and later it's released as a clip, a video clip. And then we also get an audio clip of a man's voice saying down the hill. And then later, several months later, released a little bit more and we're told he's saying guys down the hill. And what was difficult about that, Dan, was nobody could decide was was guys from another part of the audio. And down the hill was a different portion of the audio and they had put them together for the public to hear. But one thing that was obvious to me and many other people was that this was the suspect controlling the victims. This was the suspect moving the victim. So it is an abduction by definition at this point. He's controlling their movements. He's taking them somewhere that they do not want to go. And from what we were being told, there was about 40 seconds or so, 43 seconds, I believe, of audio clip. And so when you hear that, go, okay, well, we got the audio clip must have come from the video. The video and the audio clip must be one and the same. So does that mean we have 40 to 45 seconds of video as well? What other audio could be on there? What other video could be on there? And it's very likely what happened was that as he approached that, look, Libby was smart enough and brave enough to to film him briefly, but also smart enough that as he got near, she probably concealed her phone in some manner, either putting it in her pocket or or at least holding it down. And, and maybe the audio continues, but there's no video that is important to the investigation after that that clip of him on the bridge. So where the audio, the video, the picture, all of that was great evidence. And 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 thank thank you to the braveness of these two girls because I don't know, Dan, I sit here in 2023 and I have to wonder without that, would we where would we be? Would this still be a case without an arrest? And if so, how long would it have been until an arrest was made? And would this have been a case, would have been a double homicide, could have potentially gone unsolved for forever? Now, of course, it's not adjudicated yet, but yeah, I really wonder without Libby and, and Abby really putting themselves out there and getting and collecting this evidence for us, what the state of the investigation would be today. Yes, absolutely. 
Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second to hear from our sponsor. Are you aware that presently, on average, it can take up to 11 weeks for a business to hire for open positions? And if you're a growing business, you don't have up to 11 weeks to wait. Well, if you're listening today, I've got some advice for you. Stop waiting and start using ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter can help you find qualified candidates for all your roles fast. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. How is ZipRecruiter so efficient at helping you hire? Because its matching technology finds qualified candidates for you, so you can personally invite them to apply for the roles you need to fill. Four out of five employers using ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate within the first day. So speed up your hiring process with ZipRecruiter. See why 3.8 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Just go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash M-U-R-D-E-R. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Now, when we last left off, you talked about, thank God that Libby had the presence of mind to capture this bridge guy. What about the find my phone feature? Why was that not? working on Libby's phone. Libby had done, with the assistance of a relative, had done a factory reset on her phone. And in fact, when her family was out looking for her and looking for Abby the night that they were missing, they were attempting to use that Find My Phone feature that many of us are familiar with on our our cell phones. But when Libby had done the factory reset on her phone, you have to go in and a lot of the apps, you have to reinstall them. And this was an app that she had not reinstalled on her phone. And therefore, it was not working that night when the families were out looking for the girls. Let's talk about some of the people that come up as suspects and why. And first off, Ron Logan. Well, Ron Logan, he becomes a suspect because technically the girls, their bodies are found on his property. So as we said, you know, this is public property, the trail system, and then you go over the Monon High Bridge. And then once you get over that side, so being a rite of passage, typically what people do, Dan, is they go to the other side of the bridge. You, you know, you raise your, your arms up in victory. You've, you've done something, you've achieved something that some people have passed on and you just, there's really nothing to do once you get to the other side of the bridge. It's a bunch of private property once we get to that other side of the bridge. So typically, the kids, the teenagers, they turn around and, and go back. Now, some people will use this as as a way to access the trail system. So other people are coming from that side, but it's it's rare from my understanding. Ron Logan becomes suspect for the first reason, just the proximity, his property and where the bodies are found. And then, of course, he is on the news, the local news, which very quickly spreads throughout the state of Indiana and beyond the state line. And people are looking at Ron Logan's image. And mind you, we've not heard the audio clip yet at this point. But people are going, oh, my goodness, this guy that's doing this interview, he's wearing a a blue, a dark blue jacket. And people were saying online and sure, locally as well, that this guy looks like the image of the guy that we have on on the bridge. So uh, for for that reason, he is looked at. Now, one thing that I did in the book was I do talk about several other cases. Some of them kind of touch on them a little more briefly than others. A a couple of the cases I go quite in depth with. And I also go into a bunch of the, the suspects. And while nobody was named publicly by law enforcement as a an actual suspect, there were certainly many people that were named by the public and people online as potential suspects in the Delphi murder case. And a lot of them for good reason. We're not talking with the exception of Ron Logan. The other people that I mentioned in the book are are pretty horrible people, people that were involved in either rape, murder, abduction, those types of crimes, which isn't very far from what we're talking about with the Delphi case. So in the book, a couple of things that I did on purpose, and I think it was necessary to Dan was on True Crime Garage, one thing that we've learned over the years, and I know any good investigator will tell you this, and if you read any John Douglas book, you're going to get a heavy dose of this, but you can take these other cases, right? When you're reviewing this unsolved case and you're trying to make heads or tails of 
each of the different details and pieces of evidence in the case, you can often take other cases, especially ones that have been solved. And you can go, you know what, what did we learn in that case that had a similar situation or it had a similar aspect to that investigation? What did we learn by that once it was solved? And how can we apply it to this unsolved case? And so that's something we do on, on the podcast. And so, of course, I did it there in the book. And then also there were there were talks of maybe this case is tied to other unsolved cases. The, the Evansdale case is one that it was rumored to possibly be tied to for a very long period of time. And we know that law enforcement actually looked into that because of the similarities. Now, these cases took place great distance, not only in time and, and distance from one another, but some of the aspects were the same. Two victims abducted in broad daylight mm -hmm. in the middle of the day in a public setting. And at this, not exactly sure where the, the Evansdale victims were last when they, when they were abducted. If we, if we knew that for a fact, we'd probably know who's responsible. But I thought that it was fitting and I thought it was educational for not just the reader, but me piecing the story together as well to examine some of these other cases. And of course, take a good look at all of the people that were named online or otherwise as suspects in the Delphi case. What's interesting is also uh, you you write about it to a certain degree is that and then but you put yourself in this re real time scenario to demonstrate this is that a lot of these people look very good because of those similarities. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's sort of a phenomena where you you are adamant to be able to close this and some of these people because of the crimes that they have already committed and the similarities in the crime in many of the aspects it looks like we're very close to finding the person that's the perpetrator in this case and then you talk about an announcement about a development in the case with somebody online named anthony Schatz. can you explain this case where this phenomena is on display well, and I think that it's it's fair, right? I think that it's human nature. We we want to mm -hmm. know who did this. We want to get the bad guy off of the streets. We want to protect our family and more more so our children. And we're talking about a child predator who took the lives of Abby and Libby. Yes. And so a very dangerous person. And it's also, it's very difficult for any of us. And it should be, rightfully so, it should be. It's very difficult for any of us to believe that, okay, this guy woke up on this day and abducted and killed two children. It's very difficult for any of us to wrap our heads around the idea he has not done this before. And of course, if he's done it once, he's always capable of doing it again. So it's very natural to look at somebody that's done some other horrible, despicable act of evil and then say, you know what, can, can we put him in Delphi? on that afternoon. Sure. Can we put, because, because really, truly out of all the arguments and all the debates that were going on online or, or in the dark corners of bars throughout this country, because again, this was a nationwide case, and especially here in the Midwest of the United States, it was a case that was talked about at great length and a great deal by many people and being covered on a lot of media outlets as well. But Everybody seemed to have their favorite suspect, somebody that they liked better than the others. And so I think that people wanted to see, let's, can we take this person and fit him in here? But, but again, at the end of the day, all that truly matters, you can wipe away a lot of the good arguments that people made over the years for individuals. The key ingredient here to this, the secret sauce of solving this investigation is you have to be able to put that individual on the trail system between 2 p.m. and even, let's say, 5 p.m. at probably the latest that day. And if you cannot put that person there between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. that day, he's not a good suspect. And as far as Anthony Schatz goes, that was, that was a whole kind of new or maybe resurgence is probably a better word for the investigation. because. Early on, there there was some rumors because of social media and and the nature of some of the the details that were coming out about the case 
and a lot of speculation and, and some of it very disrespectful speculation about the two victims, their children that we're talking about here, that was coming out and that was kind of made up about the two victims. But there was talk that so much so that social media aspect or, or some kind of dating app aspect was was important to this investigation. In fact, at one time, they there were people online calling Bridge Guy the Snapchat killer. And so when this information comes out about Anthony underscore shots, Indiana State Police were looking for information about this Anthony underscore shots character. And they came across some of this information in their Delphi murder investigation. Well, people's ears perked up and immediately they thought, well, this the two have to go hand in hand. The two have to be directly tied together. Law enforcement basically said that to us as far as many people were concerned. And I'm, I got to tell you, Dan, when I started learning more about the fictitious Anthony Schatz character, the catfishing team potentially catfishing team, I should say, of a one Kegan Klein and and then his father, Tony or Anthony Klein, is referenced a lot in in talks about Kegan. But Kegan was actively, he's been charged with 30 different counts of of such types of behavior. Of basically this is a predator that we need to make more parents and children aware of. Absolutely. Because what this guy was doing is downright despicable and at the same time, he seems to navigate these waters with ease. And I don't think that he's a particularly bright guy. I know that he's he's really good when it comes to lying. I could tell you that from all the transcripts that I've reviewed. But to put it plain and simple for those that don't know, Kagan Klein took a picture of a model, this Justin Bieber looking kind of model, attractive young model guy, with blonde hair, six pack abs. And he creates this fake fictitious online profile of of this young, good-looking guy with a bunch of money and sports cars. And oh, by the way, this young, good-looking guy with the money and the sports cars, for some reason, he wants to talk to a bunch of on underage girls online. And not only does he want to talk to them, he wants to try to get pictures from them, pictures of them, pictures and videos from them. He's asking them, could you, you think your younger sister would be interested in sending me some pictures? And a, a lot of the the back and forth, a lot of the dialogue between Anthony Schatz, again, this fictitious character, and these victims that he found on social media and on apps and on the internet is very gross stuff, very, very disgusting stuff. But again, he was able to do this with with relatively relatively easily and 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 able to even network with the victims. And the thing that really stood out to me, Dan, and, and I'm sitting here looking at this thing. And as you know, and as you keep pointing out, the book is written in, and my thoughts are delivered kind of in real time as I'm experiencing the investigation and the information coming out. And I sat there going, man, if this guy is not involved in some form or fashion, I would be shocked because the thing that stood out that I found bizarre was that he was he was talking to underage girls in Indiana. That to me seemed very different. Look, look, online predators have been around for a long time, but oftentimes these guys are talking to people in other states, even other countries. This guy was purposely talking to girls that he may know their families or had been to cities that they lived in, girls that lived somewhat nearby. And so that was a very different kind of and a more scary online predator to me to think that he had better access to his victims if he wanted to go and meet them or or try to lure them somewhere. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages. Now, Anthony Schatz and the Klein family looked so good because, like you say, they were corresponding with, as you write, a friend of Libby, this Alexis, was corresponding with this Anthony Schatz. And you write that Libby also became infatuated with this Anthony Schatz. So this pair looked like, based on everything, looked like they would be the perpetrators. They were possibly, you said, Anthony, Tony, the father could be the bridge guy. But then you were 
working and you were away from the garage, mm -hmm. from the true crime garage, and you got a message. Tell us about this incredible day uh, that you got that message and what that message was. Yeah. And and that goes along with the idea that I was going to be shocked if it was anybody other than or if Kagan Klein was not involved, because that is what law enforcement was saying to Kagan Klein. Right. Was that Libby, I believe their their exact words were, were Libby was infatuated with Anthony Schatz. And I don't know how much of that was interrogation tactics. We have a trial that will happen at some point, Dan, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot more once this thing comes to trial. But yeah, you're right. I was out. I do work for a couple of nonprofit organizations. And on that particular day, I was working with the Porchlight Project. And the Porchlight Project is a nonprofit victim advocacy program that a friend of mine, James Renner, who you've had on your show. He's a true crime author as well. Yes. He founded this and he asked me to be involved. And so I'm a board member and I do a little more than just vote on what cases we should take on. I, I go out there and actually get boots on the ground with a couple of the cases and been involved uh, heavily with some of the cases. So on that day, I was, I was driving about two and a half hours away from my home to wrap up a couple of things with the case that we were working on. We have actually solved couple cases and, and furthered along some investigations. So very proud to be a part of that great organization. If you want to learn more about what it is that we do and, and if you can get involved, go to porchlightonline.org. But yeah, on that day, Dan, I got a text from somebody in Indiana law enforcement and it simply said, an arrest has been made, Delphi, Indiana. And I knew, I knew exactly what that had meant without needing further description. And I was able to wrap up what I was doing that day and leave relatively quickly because all I could think about was, my goodness, if this, because this case, as many of them are, um, but, you know, I was, I was completely wrapped up in this case for a very long period of time. And so yes. it had a lot of highs and a lot of lows, like many cases do. But this case in particular had a lot of rumors they would come out and a lot of them were just bad rumors. And and very quickly, you could do a little fishing of your own and figure out, you know, this is probably nothing. This is something that we're probably going to learn in 48 to 72 hours. It's it's nothing. It's, it's all a bunch of hocus pocus. But in this situation, it felt different because of the source that it came from to me. And so I, I knew that there was something here. I had no clue what it was. But then before I could even get home, my phone was <laughs> my phone was blowing up with texts from people that listen to the show, from my co-host, the captain on True Crime Garage, and from people that I have met that I consider to be colleagues throughout the true crime podcasting community over the years. So I knew that this was different. This information was going to be different. And so that was the the announcement of an arrest. And that was August of 2022. And now we sit here in, in May of 2023, and we still have a bail hearing that's going to take place in June. And we have a trial that will take place at some point, but we're still people that have followed this case for six years now. They're looking to have a lot of their questions answered and, and hopefully get to that point when it goes to trial. Hopefully they've got the right guy. I talk a lot about Richard Allen, who was the person that they arrested uh, toward the end of the book. And I talk a lot about uh, what they do and don't have and what they may have and what they might not have on this guy. But we should see, I'm hopeful that we're going to see a conclusion soon. And part of the reason why I wrote the book too, I want to make sure that before we wrap up today, Dan, that I do say that the, you know, over the years, there's been a lot of weird, bizarre and unflattering, disrespectful things said about the families of these two girls that were taken away right. and really upset me over the years. Yes. These families have experienced something that hopefully none of us should ever experience. This, this is about the worst tragedy that you can think of. And in fact, I, I usually say that one's character is best judged in a time of tragedy. And there is no greater tragedy than, than what we're talking about in the Delphi murders case. Yes. And these families handled themselves with courage and with a level of grace that I don't think most of us possess. So I was I was very angered to see people talk disrespectfully about the families over the years. And part of the reason why I wrote the book was to have a, a very direct and definitive timeline of, of how this case kind of played out in the public eye. And, and again, 
my a lot of my thoughts and, and feelings about the case as we were all kind of experiencing it as the information came out over over the course of over five years. And then we finally get an arrest and it could be seven years or so before we, we see a conclusion as far as the courts are concerned. One interesting aspect, you said in a search warrant, there was some interesting things found because there was a, a shell that was found, a caliber shell that was found at the crime scene. And in that search of Richard Allen, they found a spent shell and the gun that was connected to it, didn't they? Yeah. So the, he does some things that are and it made some statements to law enforcement that will make things rather difficult for his defense team. One, he puts himself at the crime scene on the day in question. He puts himself at the crime scene right around the time in question. You know, we backtrack to what we said earlier between 2 and 5 p.m. So he's there. He's dressed like bridge guy by his own admission, and he looks like bridge guy. I say that after having said that I don't think it's that great of a picture, but I think most of us would agree he doesn't look unlike bridge guy is probably more fair to say. And then a big problem that Richard Allen has, and he has maintained his innocence, and he is innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. But, you know, he he said that that round, so it's a live round that it would have been racked through his gun and ejected out the side of 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 his gun, the six hour gun. And they say that it, scientifically they can prove that the markings made when that bullet was ejected from his gun, they can prove that it came from his gun. And the statement that he gave to law enforcement was one, he's never lent that gun to anybody, never let anybody mm-hmm. borrow that gun. And two, he's never been to the exact location where the bodies were later found. Yeah, And we know that what I believe that there's probably a lot more. But, Dan, what we've been told is the key piece of evidence is that bullet that was found roughly about two feet away from one of the victims. And in fact, it's the way that it's reported and even stated in some legal documents is that the bullet was found between the two victims. So that bullet and where they found it. And yeah, it it creates a big problem for for Richard Allen Mm. in this case. Mm hmm. In your acknowledgments, you talk about that writing this true crime book, you mentioned that already, has always been a dream of yours, but you also acknowledge your brother, the captain, and your audience, and your appreciation of what the true crime garage audience and the, the whole process has aided in this dream of writing your first true crime book. Yeah. You know, my my first love, my first passion is True Crime Garage, the podcast that we do. I, You know, it's crazy to think that we've been doing it. Later this year be, will be eight years. And Dan, wow. I know you've been at it longer than we have, but it's been a lot of fun. It's also been a lot of work. You know, when we first, my brother and I, the captain and I first started doing the show together, we were both working other jobs. We mm-hmm. were both putting in long hours together. And this was something that we did in our our free time, in our, in our spare hours. It yeah. was something that we built together and an audience that we built together. And the audience is, our audience is the best. I mean, we yeah. They've they've helped us so much along the way by telling friends and family to check out our show, and so we we have the best, most loyalist, and most engaging audience. So that's not lost on me for a second. If it, Dan it, had it not been for the show and the success of the show, I don't know that I would have ever been able to achieve this goal of of writing this book. And and I do want to say um, for for those. True crime garage listeners that are tuning into True Murder. I I know that we have a lot of the same audience, but I, I would believe there's some people tuning into True Murder for the first time from a garage loyal garage listeners. And mm-hmm. I want to point out this is while this is the first time that we are having a conversation on Mike and the first time that I'm on True Murder, it's not the first time that our paths have crossed. That's right. You've been great to our show too throughout the years. We we covered the Luca Magnata case and the Sydney Tearhues case. And in both cases, I had reached out to you and said, Dan, uh, could you give us a quote or your thoughts or feelings on this part of the investigation or or the suspect? And both times you came through, no problems. And offered up a soundbite. So we really appreciate you and and the good work that you do over at True Murder and, and the times that you've helped us out at the garage. It's been a privilege to be able to interview you and um, congratulations on the success of, of True Crime Garage. And now for the success that's sure to come from the Delphi murders, the quest to find the man on the bridge. 
And thank you so much for uh, once upon a time, I was told by fans of True Murder that uh, that you had referred to me as the godfather of true crime. And again, a incredible uh, compliment. So I, I appreciate that so much. And I appreciate all the things you've said today. I want to thank you so much, Nick Edwards, for coming on and talking about the Delphi murders, the quest to find the man on the bridge. I know people know where to find you. And thank you for this interview. And you have a great evening, Nick Edwards. Thank you so much, Dan.